Good afternoon. My name is Sharon, and I'll be your conference operator today. At this time, I'd like to welcome everyone to the Quinn MCC National Learning and Action Network follow-up event, Driving Safer Care Conference Call. Our lines are based on mute to prevent any background noise. After the speaker's remarks, there will be a question and answer session. If you'd like to ask a question during this time, simply press star from the number one on your telephone keypad. If you would like to withdraw your question, press the pound key. Thank you. Ms. Brianna Goss with the Quinn MCC in your beginner conference. Thank you, Sharon. Good afternoon, and thank you for joining us for the National Learning and Action Network follow-up event, part of our quarterly Sharing Knowledge, Improving Health Care series. We're very happy to have you with us today and we, as we follow up with the speakers from the August 2nd National Learning and Action, or LAN, event, Driving Safer Care. My name is Brianna Goss, and I'm a Manager of Quality Improvement for Telogen. I work with the Quality Innovation Network National Coordinating Center, or the Quinn NCC. So just a few reminders and housekeeping items before we get started today. Uh, again, thank you for joining us in the WebEx Event Center. In order to join the event online, you will need to access your registration confirmation email and registration ID in order to log into the WebEx. My colleague, Kathy Manfrey from the Quality Innovation Network National Coordinating Center, will be monitoring our WebEx chat board, so please be sure to participate as we go along and feel free to ask your questions. Slides, resources, and the recording from today's session will be posted to qioprogram.org website under the News and Events tab. And some of the resources you will see are already posted there. So let's get started by reviewing today's agenda. First, I will go over the purpose of this call and a few housekeeping items. Then I will introduce each of our three speakers today. We have Carol Moss with Niles Project, Dr. Jason Newland from the St. Louis Children's Hospital and Washington University, and we have Dr. Sharon Alaranta from Call of Health. There will be time for facilitated discussion following the recap presentation by Carol and Dr. Newland. There will be an additional opportunity for facilitated discussion following Dr. Elorazzo's presentation. Finally, I will wrap up with a reminder to complete our post-event assessment and provide a plug for an upcoming call. So I'd like to take a moment to remind our participants about the purpose of this important series of learning and sharing events. Without reading all of the content on the slide, I'll just mention a few high points. The audience today is very broad and inclusive of a variety of healthcare provider types, partners, and patients. The purpose of these events is to offer virtual learning and sharing events with a focus on ideas and concepts related to healthcare quality improvement. Our expectations are that you all think of actionable ways to implement the ideas and concepts presented today and make a commitment to share the information with your own team. And finally, we are always opening, open to new ideas and suggestions for topics to bring to this audience. So feel free to send your ideas through the chat or through the post-event assessment. To address the direct purpose of today's event, we are working to prepare healthcare professionals, partners, and patients to implement effective and safer care strategies. We hope that you'll identify opportunities for improvement in your own work with an overall focus to improve the quality of care provided to Medicare beneficiaries. Again, we're hoping to make this as interactive as possible, which can be challenging given such a large audience. Therefore, we ask you to commit as individuals to be attentive, active, and actionable, thinking about all the ways the content is relevant to your work and your priorities. We welcome your active participation by clicking the green check in the WebEx application. Click the conversation bubble and choose yes in the drop-down menu. Next, we have a couple of polling questions. First, we want to know if you participated in the National LAN event on August 2nd. We also want to get an idea of what types of organizations are represented on this call. So we invite you to respond to a poll indicating where you are working. So WebEx, uh, Sharon, would you mind opening the two polls? So we now have about 30 seconds for you to enter your information, and then we'll go over the results.
So, uh, just to keep you guys entertained during this uh, polling break, um, in August we actually had over half of our participants were from hospitals. Um, so it's a pretty good showing from that group. So we'll see if we have a comparable showing for our follow-up event today. All right. So, Sharon, can you show us the results from the poll? So it looks like most of our participants did attend the National Land Call in August. And it looks like uh, the vast majority today are from the Quinn TYO audience. Um, and we have about nine participants today who are from hospitals um, and five saying they're from other organizations. Um, we have three also from the nursing home or skilled nursing facility sector. So thank you all for your participation in this poll. So as we mentioned during the August event, the topics of this event series align with the CMS Quality Strategy. The CMS Quality Strategy guides the healthcare transformation activities from the federal, state, and local level, including those that you are all working with in your community. The CMS Quality Strategy prioritizes six goals for success. The topic for today's call, as well as the August 2nd National Land Call, aligns with the CMS Quality Strategy Goal to make care safer by reducing harm caused in the delivery of care. In August, you heard from two very passionate speakers, Carol Moss and Dr. Jason Newland. Their missions focus on reducing harm in the delivery of care, primarily by avoiding preventable HAIs, or, again, those are healthcare-associated infections. We are grateful to have Carol and Dr. Newland back with us today. We're also excited to welcome Dr. Sharon Eloranca as a speaker. She was a participant on the August 2nd event and will share about an antibiotic stewardship approach that her organization has incorporated. It is now my pleasure to reintroduce Carol Moss. She, along with her husband, Ty, are founders of Niles Project and parents of Niles. Carol will briefly recap her presentation now. Carol, the floor is yours. Hi, Brianna. Thanks, everyone. It's great to be here with all of you today to focus on driving safer care together. While they're setting up this video, uh, I'll tell you what it's about after it's completed. Thank you. so much for sharing that and the reason we share Niall's story with all different people in all walks of life is that we want people to be aware and be prepared because we were not aware or prepared. Niall contracted MRSA at the top children's hospital in Orange County, California um, from unclean surfaces. Within a couple of, it was, he was just in there as an outpatient, just in for an MRI and visiting a couple of doctors. 
and um, we left the hospital. He had the MRI, and he displayed the flu-like symptoms, as, as we explained, and it, it wasn't a good outcome. And the main reason is that, as many of you may know, um, that's been displayed and, and has been shared in the new vital signs uh, report that the CDC just put out. Um, over 254,000 people die every year from sepsis. And, and really, so much of this is because of the inaction and the fact that people are not aware of what sepsis looks like and what needs to be done quickly because time matters. So um, we were really thankful to work with the CDC on this campaign. Nile loved life. He overcame what he was uh, what he was given at birth. He had hydrocephalus. Um, he had he had lots of um, challenges, but he overcame all of that, and he became this great young man that uh, was a leader. And uh, and so uh, he'd gone in to have you know several surgeries in his life, neurosurgeries, and and they were fine. He never had a problem until he just went in for this MRI. Um, once we learned about MRSA that he contracted, we really wanted to do something about educating people, and we started working with the public, understanding what's going on with other people. We started um, really focusing on uh, a new organization that would reach out to the communities, educate people, and then we started to realize, you know, I think we need some new laws in place because people have known how to prevent these infections for decades, and quite frankly, the healthcare workers aren't getting what they need from the trustees in preventing harm because they're not isolating patients when they are, have been known to have um, infectious diseases. They're not uh, given the tools that they need. And so we not only work with the public to educate them, we also work with policymakers, with trustees of hospitals, with healthcare workers, so that everyone understands this is a big problem, but it's all preventable. The hope is that it is preventable. We were able to put two new laws in place for the state of California that you can actually access by going to Google and typing in my hospital 411 infection map, and those people in the state of California can look at their hospitals and see from Niles Law how they're doing on preventing the antibiotic-resistant infections and C. diff. And these, the data that you'll see is very important for making decisions on what hospitals we want to go to. The new culture that we want to impress upon all of you is that the culture of change, and we are hopeful. It's been 10 years that God has given us to really understand why, and we are thankful for CMS and, and the, the the, they're hearing everyone's story. Patient stories are so important. And now they've implemented important things that have to do with pay for performance as opposed to pay for the quantity of care, pay for the quality of the outcome for each patient. And we're so thankful for the accountability of that. But it also brings on the importance of public participation. Each one of us needs to be educated about what is happening in hospitals, how your hospital's doing, how is your surgeon. So we're really thankful for this new era of sharing information on social media. There's all kinds of places that CMS is facilitating just like this conversation we're having today in infection prevention, environmental cleaning, sepsis prevention, and reducing the use of antibiotics. These are all such important areas that each one of us need to really understand and become experts for our families, for ourselves, just like when we go buy a car. And healthcare workers need to know every piece of this because they, of course, are there to take care of the patients. And so we're so thankful that we've been a part of um, this, the, this, the discussion that we had in August and the one today, and we will be around forever. We are focused on bringing preventable care and making sure that um, health care workers get what they need and, in the bottom line, making health care safer by driving safer care. And we do this in honor of our son, Niall. 
Thank you so much, Carol. Um, we really appreciate you being here with us again. It is now my pleasure to reintroduce our next speaker for his presentation recap from last month. Dr. Jason Newland is the director of the Antimicrobial Stewardship Program at St. Louis Children's Hospital. He is also Associate Professor of Pediatrics at Washington University. He will talk about what links antibiotic resistance and its outcomes by speaking to the role of antimicrobial stewardship initiatives. Dr. Newland, the floor is yours. Uh, thank you, Brian. Uh, thanks. It's always a pleasure to be speaking, especially alongside Carol and the passion that she uh, has. And obviously, uh, it just reiterates why we're all here on this call and what we have to do to continue to prevent deaths from antibiotic-resistant infections. Um, I, uh, I do have a disclosure, a rapid diagnostic company, but I think most importantly, we have to have principles in our hospitals um, that will allow us to have a safer hospital, as Carol mentioned. And those things are these high reliability principles with the capstone being safety. And these things will lead to the safer care, which is we're pre preoccupied with any failure, failures. We, re we are reluctant to simplify any, anything that occurs that we feel is a, a problem. We are sensitive to the operations. Therefore, we, we listen to our frontline providers and those who are in the quote-unquote trenches of the hard work and caring for our patients and families. We are committed to be resilient when things don't go the way we they are intended, and we will defer to the experts. Um, those are the expertise of the frontline providers. Those are the expertise of, the, of even the patients and families as they know their children and, the, and their loved ones um, as they are caring for them. But I think importantly, um, we're here to talk about how do we prevent antibiotic resistant infections, and, and, and key in that is development of programs such as the antimicrobial stewardship program uh, that many people are developing, and that we'll hear in a little bit about um, from Dr. Alaranta about what work they have done. But in addition to these antimicrobial stewardship programs, we need further research on on better diagnostics so we can identify these our septic patients and those with bacterial infections sooner so that we can assure they're on the right therapies at the right time for the, with the right dose for the right duration. That means know the best length of therapy. We must reduce hospital-acquired infections. That is involved in doing better hand hygiene, better vaccination, utilizing all the infection control and prevention techniques that have been demonstrated to improve the safety of our patients and families. But beyond just these vaccines, there's other aspects of antimicrobial stewardship that includes the whole society, such as reducing our antimicrobial use in the agriculture. Uh, and then finally, we're going to need more antimicrobials. Um, we're going to continue to use antibiotics and antifungals and others, um, and likely we will see resistance to those agents. So we need to support uh, the research and development of new antimicrobials so that we can continue to have the safe care that, or the uh, appropriate antibiotic care that we've been able, that has been afforded to us since the 1930s. So what do I ask of you all and for all of us to do is to continue to support the development of these antimicrobial stewardship actions and programs so that we can assure that antimicrobials are used appropriately. That will make sure that we can treat patients like Nile quickly, accurately, so that we can, we can provide the best outcomes. It will also lead to using appropriate antibiotics so that we don't cause C. difficile infections, which results in up to 29,000 deaths annually. We need to empower our healthcare workers to be able to prevent infections. We need to make it easy for hand hygiene to occur, easy for vaccination to occur, easy for to do the right thing when it comes to preventing infections like surgical site infections and central line associated infections. We must vaccinate. We must be adherent to mandatory vaccination campaigns in our healthcare environments, such as influenza campaigns, which we know will prevent a number of deaths. And finally, we need to obviously wash our hands all the time and support our farmers who raise animals without or judicially without or judicially using uh, antibiotics. Thank you, Thank you. Pat. Thank you, Brandon. Thank you, Dr. Newland. Um, we appreciate you being able to join us again as well today. At this time, I would like to open it up for questions and comments for Carol and Dr. Newland. Uh, I invite Kathy, our chat facilitator, to share about conversation happening in the chat and any questions you all have posed. 
Once again, if you'd like to ask a question, please press star and the number one on your telephone keypad. While we're waiting for people to enter the queue, Kathy, are there any questions in chat? We do have a couple. There's one here that says, why don't hospitals use agar samples to check the bacteria on surfaces on high tech areas? And why don't they have daily ongoing or monthly sampling so they can make sure surfaces are clean? Could you repeat the first one again? I'm sorry. Why don't hospitals use agar samples to check the bacteria on surfaces on high tech areas? So um, I think this is a, a, one of the points with infection prevention and control that we're working on more and more. These are the active surveillance um, aspects of, of prevention of infections. And I think as we learn more and more about the best environmental cleaning, which I think things that such as what Carol talked about and some of the laws that have been passed in California are so key to, uh, will drive some of those practices. Part of it also is just the finances of healthcare and trying to take the cost benefit the most cost beneficial aspects of this. Um, and so, I, again, I think these are controversial topics. Uh, we talk about even active surveillance of patients as they come in and figuring out what's the best and most effective strategies. And we'll continue to need to do these sorts of things and investigate whether or not they provide the benefits that they're intended to provide. So, Sarah, oh, go ahead. We've got a few more. Do you want to check some from the line first? Let's see on that, or just go ahead with these. Once again, if you'd ask a question, please press star one. And we do not have any questions over the phone at this time. Okay, let's go ahead and address the questions in chat then. Thanks, Kathy. So, for the, I don't know if they feel like if our speakers might be the right one to address this, but we can get through. Apparently, journalists, are there any collaborative efforts underway at the federal level to connect CMS, CDC, the FDA, and or the Department of Agriculture regarding antibiotic resistance? Um, yes, there are collaborative efforts ongoing. As a matter of fact, last year um, at the White House Forum of Antibiotic Stewardship that Carol was able and I were both able to attend, they actually had a aspect of that which was dedicated solely to the antimicrobial uh, stewardship in the agriculture industry. And so, and there's been working group at CDC that has specifically addressed, um, been addressing antimicrobial uh, resistance in the agriculture industry. And so, I, I think uh, the simple answer is yes, and I think we're waiting to see some of the effort, some of those efforts and what will come about from them. And I, and I do believe in talking with some veterinarian colleagues that there is some progress being made in uh, improving our use of antimicrobials in the agriculture industry. Exactly. This is Carol. I did want to add um, what what is important for everyone to know on the phone is that every quarter there is a meeting called the CARB meeting, and that is Combating Antibiotic Resistance. And it is a public meeting that's held in Washington, D.C., but you can also monitor it online. I would urge every single healthcare worker, every single public member, to participate, if you just go to Google and, and type in PAC CARB, P A C C A R B, um, and then say meeting schedules, you'll get the dates that come up and you'll get into the website. This is so critical and we need the public's voice and we need healthcare workers' voice. These are 15 members that are um, that have been nominated to represent all of us. We have one public member. Her name is Elisa Cold. She is a walking miracle who survived all kinds of, of antibiotic resistance, and she survived. And so these are all people making decisions on how we're going to combat this, and we really need to have the public participate and share your infection stories. Prevention is the number one way, and this committee needs to know that preventing these infections by environmental cleaning and by all the preventative measures that we know how to do, um, that's the way to go. And they, sometimes they stray into another direction that's going to take too long. So 
if you and and um, Nikki, it might be good to for me to send it over the link that's specific for people to follow along with this. And it's a quarterly meeting, and it will happen for the next five years. So this is a, a global problem that we all need to be a part of solving. Thank you. And I think we have time for one more question from the chat. Okay, well, that's how the oven, so we'll, we'll check some of them here. Um, one of the best approaches, I think I may have had this one last time, Diana, but what is the best approach for people who say vaccinations don't work, or is it the flu from the flu vaccine? So I won't get it. The best approach is always to continue to educate on the myths, on those unfortunate myths that still continue to be uh, propagated, such as um, getting the flu from the flu vaccine, which we know uh, is not true. Um, there are instances where the flu vaccine doesn't work as well as it should, but that doesn't preclude us or make us not get it. Um, we definitely need to continue to uh, obtain that influenza vaccine and just and we need to look at the data that demonstrates all the deaths that occur annually from influenza and the complications of influenza. Thanks everybody for a great discussion. Uh, now I would like to introduce our final speaker. Sharon Alaranta is the Medical Director of Quality and Safety Initiatives at Qualis Health. Dr. Alaranta will discuss their Jump Start Stewardship Workbook and how they've been using it to drive safer care. Dr. Alaranta, the floor is yours. Thanks so much, Diana. And I'm looking forward, we can go ahead to the little title slide, um, discussing our Jump Start Stewardship for Critical Access Hospital Workbook and the program from which it came. On the next slide, I believe most of you, because most of us are Queen QIOs, already know that Qualis Health is the Queen QIO for the state of Washington and Idaho. And we do have uh, large rural and frontier areas in both of these states, so the need to work with uh, the rural health care is um, obvious for us. Next slide, please. During this quick talk, I'm going to discuss these three things. Um, describing the need for infection prevention program assistance including antimicrobial stewardship in critical access hospitals. I want to talk about how our workbook was used here in Washington State and review just three selected features of the Jump Start workbook itself. And I do want to also say that um, antimicrobial stewardship obviously has a tie-in with sepsis, and um, we may be able to talk a little bit about that as well. So for those of you that are on the line, and I don't know that there's that many that aren't familiar with what a critical access hospital is, these tend to be small, rural, and remote hospitals that have very few acute care beds. They're located at uh, long or difficult distances from other hospitals or other sources of health care. tend to have a uh, small, overworked staff, and everyone there wears many hats. So if you think about the infection preventionist um, in a small and critical access hospital, that person may well be a person who just the day before was a foreigner, for example with interest but perhaps very little training in how to build and carry out an infection prevention program. Additionally, that person often continues to wear many hats, perhaps being pulled into still nursing shifts, maybe managing or working in a laboratory, or doing employee health or other tasks. At Qualis Health, we developed a program called EQUIP, E-Q-U-I-P, which stands for Education, Quality, and Infection Prevention, as a curriculum to help these critical access infection preventionists become equipped to design and implement a, an infection prevention program, including antimicrobial stewardship, that would work in this complex setting of the critical access hospital. Next slide, please. The EQUIPS program is a joint partnership between Qualis Health, the Washington State Department of Health, the Washington State Hospital Association, and the two local chapters of the Association for Professionals in Infection Control, or APEC. Uh, it is a program that covers multiple topics through in-person sessions and monthly webinars, including the basic principles of infection prevention, environmental services, cell processing, communicable diseases, outbreak investigations, microbiology basics, and more. See the topics listed above in the kind of orange font there, along with the presenting organizations of an example of how the partnership was actually um, operationalized. It seems to the group that formed this partnership that antimicrobial stewardship deserved an entire day of its own, not just an hour-long webinar. Um, given the local and national attention that you've already heard other presenters talk about, 
on multidrug resistant organisms and the impact of microbial use in healthcare. Our partners eagerly appreciate, agreed to participate in our training day. And I do want to point out that our Washington State Department of Health Healthcare Associated Infections Division is participating in the One Health, it's called One Washington here in our state, um, working on a unified approach to antimicrobial use, including human health care, veterinary care, and use in agriculture. Next slide. So this is a picture of the Jumpstart Stewardship Workbook cover there on the left side, where you can see the logos of our participating partners, and without them it would not have come to fruition. The URL where you can access the copy is up there on the right side. I encourage you to download it, take a look through it, and please please give us feedback. Um, we did use this in the course of a day-long workshop, which I'll talk about in a moment. And I did want to brag a little bit that one of our partners sent a copy of this workbook in advance um, to Dr. Arjun Srinivasan of the Centers for Disease Control. He is their director for healthcare associated infection prevention programs, and he wrote back, on the small hospital workbook, I can't recall if I already congratulated you on this, but it is fantastic, Arjun. So we were really happy about that. Next page. Next slide. This is how we actually use, Qualis Health actually used the Jumpstart Stewardship Workbook. It was uh, used as a tool along with a day-long um, conference. Um, the times came out a little bit funny on the right-hand side, but that is an example. That was how the schedule for the day went. On the left-hand side was our um, publicity kind of of how the day would go. And the workshop was held in the first March in Spokane, Washington, in conjunction with the Northwest Regional Rural Health Conference, and featured faculty from the Department of Health, the APIC Pastures, and Qualis Health, along with an infectious disease physician from the University of Washington, and a pharmacist representing the AMS work at the Washington State Hospital Association. The idea really was to use the workbook as an active planning tool. Participants heard brief lectures, as you can see on the top half of the agenda there, about multiple topics that are covered in an AMS program and then use the afternoon um, to sit around a table with team members and complete the exercises that are within the workbook that would lead to actionable next steps for implementation of a program. As we like to say in quality improvement, what could they do by next Tuesday? What could they leave this meeting on Monday, March 14th and go back um, the following Tuesday to really um, begin implementing a program? Um, more than 70 people attended the workshop, and the reviews were positive. It's always a work in progress. Next slide, please. So I'm just going to review examples of three of the tools that are within the um, workbook. Again, really uh, request feedback from all of you. Um, with, within quality improvement, a key element is to know where you're starting from. And so the first tool in the workbook is the current state assessment. We recommend for all hospitals, but in this case it was designed for critical access hospitals, to get an idea of where they are in terms of having the elements of an antimicrobial stewardship program so that once they get an idea of current state, they can attack those areas where they feel they can make the most progress, where um, they need to start working right away. Um, to create this tool, we used assessments that we uh, borrowed from the Centers for Disease Control from the Greater New York Hospital Association and the Joint Commission. Um, and this particular page is on prescribing policies. I just pulled this up at random. If you go create three questions down there, I know the font is microscopic, but it says, is there a formal procedure for all clinicians to review the appropriateness of all antibiotics 48 hours after the initial order? In other words, an antibiotic timeout. And the participants around their table would either check no or yes, and proceed through the workbook, and they may identify that having prescribing policies would be a place where they may have the opportunity to improve, and they may select that as an area to start with. Next, please. The second tool I wanted to show is about uh, helping hospitals walk through the feasibility of individual antimicrobial stewardship interventions in their setting. You can see on the left-hand side there are, there are several interventions listed there. Prospective audits and feedback, formulary restriction, education, guidelines and pathways, streamlining or de-escalation. And here's another one, uh, parental to oral conversion. Um, and I was just going to use the PO, IV to PO conversion. 
Um, this is one of the central tenets of hospital-based antimicrobial stewardship, which is to start people who are sick, as NARA was, um, very quickly on the appropriate, very strong antibiotics, but as people begin to get better and culture results come out, to get those antibiotics to be targeted to the organisms that are identified and then to change people over to the oral form of the antibiotics, leading to less widespread um, development of resistant organisms. So what the teams would do with this page in this workbook would be, you know, let's say we're going to do IV to PO conversion, is to write that in their own building on whether they think it would have a positive clinical impact, a positive financial impact, whether it would be politically expedient. Hospitals are political organizations, so there's always going to be internal socio-political consequences of any intervention you're going to select. And we encourage folks to look for win-win initiatives that achieve the goals of the antimicrobial stewardship program, as well as the goals of the others, the doctors, the nurses, the patients, the families who are involved in the care of the patients. You know, how much resource might be required, whether that be time or actual dollars, and then how easy this might be to implement. And they were encouraged to score each of these interventions, allowing them to pick something that, again, if you're going to go back and do it by next Tuesday, let's do something easy instead of something hard. And the next page, please. And the third tool I want to talk about is the cost savings worksheet. Um, with many quality improvement programs, infection prevention, antimicrobial stewardship often seen by hospital leadership as a cost center rather than a revenue center. You always have to be able to make your case that there is going to be a financial, um, at least no financial downside or very little when trying to get support from leadership to implement these programs. So this workshop, uh, worksheet, is pre-populated for that, again, the intravenous to oral conversion. You can see we put in something there about um, the antibiotic being levofloxacin and comparing the hospital's actual use over a year, number of doses, price per dose, um, IV versus oral, and going ahead and calculating what that might save that small hospital over a year. $1,400 doesn't look like a lot. In some places, it really is. And that is just there as, as a guided exercise. It will help um, folks decide on how, how much they might save through a good antimicrobial stewardship program. And the final slide is I just, we've been very pleased with the response to the Jumpstart workbook and the experience of the attendees at the workshop. Again, we only did one workshop with it. Love to hear your feedback on the workbook, and um, thank you for your time today. Thank you so much, Dr. Alarosa, for sharing your workbook with us and for being here today. At this time, I'd like to open it up for questions and comments for Dr. Eleranta as well as our two other speakers. I again invite Kathy, our chat facilitators, to share about the conversation happening in chat and any questions you all have posed. Once again, if you'd like to ask a question, please press star 1 on your telephone keypad. You do not have any questions on the phone at this time. Oh, me on it. There was one, I think, that we had for Carol. I don't know if she saw it, but we had a somebody that asked, did the hospital or not cast have a problem prior to this unfortunate event or high hospital cloud infection rate? Yes. Um, I didn't, it, it doesn't state that it was from having an MRI, but based on, um, I didn't know this in advance, but they did have some problems, and in looking at the reporting now, um, they're doing much better, but it's been 10 years, and, and so many great things have happened. So, but what is helpful is when you go into the Google map that I, the map that I shared, which is the, actually the Department of Health map, because I'm on the HAI Advisory Committee for the State of California, we're now able to gather this data, and the public can see the data as well so we can make informed decisions on what hospitals are really focused on, um, environmental cleaning, on making sure that uh, patients are isolated, and that um, all of the preventative measures are adhered to. Thank you, Carol. Sure. Thank you for the question. Let me see. We don't know if we have any extra ones or any new ones here. 
Um, we have one, um, what we'd like to get back to you and feedback on the CDC's AUR model, with the feasibility of that, if you could speak about that. Yes, uh, that's a great question. So the antibiotic use and resistance module uh, that is in the National Healthcare Safety Network from the CDC um, is a new mechanism in which we can monitor our antimicrobial use um, as well as our antimicrobial resistance. This module has been in development since around 2011, and currently there's a big push to get more hospitals delivering their data, their antimicrobial use data, to this module known as the AUR module. So what this, the antibiotic use portion of this module contains is days of therapy per thousand patient days for the antibiotics used in your institutions or your hospitals. What they do with that data is they utilize the facility survey that most or many hospitals provide to the National Healthcare Safety Network, which is also responsible for the uh, reduction of central line infections and surgical site infections. And they utilize that survey to help risk adjust the days of therapy for each institution. So, for example, the St. Louis Children's Hospital, which is a tertiary care children's hospital with bone marrow transplants, lung transplants, liver transplants, can then be compared with other children's hospitals that don't have these sorts of transplants, but that can be risk adjusted based on this facility survey. And what they'll do with that data is they'll provide each hospital what they call an observed versus expected ratio. Um, and so they can say, okay, you are using 100 days of therapy per 1,000 patient days, and based off of all the data that's come in to the CDC and going into all the different facility surveys, they can say, well, you're expected to have 85 days of therapy per 1,000 patient days therefore giving you a ratio that is above one and suggests maybe you should look into that. So that metric, this observed expected ratio, is called the standardized antimicrobial administration ratio. And at this point in time, that metric has been uh, approved as a national quality foundation metric, um, but it hasn't been put forth or has not been approved as an accountability measure by CMS. So with that long uh, discussion, I think this is the future for antimicrobial stewardship, and I think uh, we will see possibly that uh, CMS and others will be wanting us to be uh, putting our data, our antimicrobial use data, into this CDC mechanism uh, with the hope that that will drive us to improve antimicrobial use. Um, it should be noted that that metric is a quantitative metric. It does not look at appropriateness of antimicrobial use, um, but uh, the CDC has been working diligently at addressing that other aspect of antimicrobial use uh, metrics, which is the appropriateness, um, which is much more challenging on how to do that in a more automated fashion. But there's definitely more to come with that, and I think it will behoove all of us to be aware of the, the changes that will come about as we learn more and more about this metric. Thank you so much for sharing that feedback on those comments for us to think about as we move on. Thank you, Steve, I'm in here for um, Dr. Alonso about the workshop. First of all, thanks for sharing that with us. Um, Smoking the workshop with the workshop is a great idea. And we listen to them teams work together through the exercise. Did you have the person that could in teams to a team, or was it primarily individuals from the facility? And you took your ideas to ensure it's not just assigned to one person. Right. That, that is really a great idea and totally gets to um, the whole dilemma of a critical access hospital. I would say we had variable success. I would say probably two-thirds of the teams that a hospital that sent attendees had more than one person attend, mostly because there was we were day one of a three-day rural health conference and the they just kind of tacked on their attendance at our meeting with attending the larger conference, and therefore they had the ability to send more than one person. And I know that was the one thing that our team commented on, which was that if a person came by themselves, um, they would have to use a little imagination when sitting around the table and working through the tools because they would be talking to people that weren't from their own facility. However, um, 
you know, yeah, that, that, that's just, that's how it goes with these small um, settings. I would also say that some of the comments we got were that that long afternoon working through every single one of those tools was pretty tiring. And I would guess if we were going to do it again, because that was just the PDSA, we might try the lecture first and then an associated tool and then maybe a lecture and a tool instead of all the lectures in a block and then all the tools at once. Thank you, Sharon. We'll check in now. This group is in a call of holding. Any questions that come in through the call? Once again, if you'd like to ask a question, please press star 1 on your drop one keypad. And we do not have any questions over the phone at this time. Okay. Got another question here, then. Um, we're moving really some of the patient safety goals at the joint commission from that way periodically. For initiatives like this, with other governing agencies to send the hospitals. Yes, we will. Actually, the Joint Commission um, just a couple of months ago um, made antimicrobial stewardship or having an active antimicrobial stewardship program really a requirement to get accreditation. They have eight elements of practice. Um, they were put in. They were, there was a public comment in the winter of 2015. Um, they did the revisions, and then it came out in July of this year in 2016 with the expectations that hospitals will be evaluated on these elements of practice as of January 1st, 2017. Um, there are, there's uh, the state of Missouri, in which I live, has um, just passed the second state mandate that um, all acute care hospitals and ambulatory surgical centers must have an active antimicrobial stewardship program. Um, California has um, led the way with these sorts of mandates, having one in 2009 and then a revision in 2012. Um, the CMS just recently uh, published um, another uh, condition of participation that hospitals will have to have an active antimicrobial stewardship. That um, condition of participation is under, or just I think the public comment period just ended. So we expect to see, um, you know, again, these active antimicrobial stewardship programs having to be present. I should say that the Joint Commission requirements are based upon the seven core elements of an effective antimicrobial stewardship program published by the CDC. Uh, that publication was about a year ago and can be found on their website. Um, and so the fact of the matter is, yes, it's, I think Arjun Srinivasan said it best uh, when I heard him at a conference recently is that, you know, antimicrobial stewardship programs have always been a good idea. Now they're a good, good idea that are required. Um, and I, so I think our hospitals are going to have to be, you know, putting in the resources and efforts as they've done with infection prevention. Now it's going to have to be for specific antimicrobial stewardship, which will need to be a separate entity than in, in infection prevention. And so I think that's, well, I loved it. I love what Dr. Alonso was talking about, just for the fact that the critical access hospitals need some help in these toolbooks and workbooks are going to be key for them. Thank you again for sharing that with Dr. Newman. You're welcome. Now, thank you for having me this, but this infection rates are so high in our nation's facilities. Why aren't these hospitals being proactive in letting the public know what they're doing to clean up their facilities? I know we can see some of that. It's still alluded to on the, the hospital compare to, to work, but, you know, what do you think is about a problem? Are the public, do you think they're really aware of what the rates are, that they know that they can look at these sites and find it? What thoughts would you have about that? I can share a little bit about that. Um, as being, as a member, a voting member for the public on the HA Advisory Committee for the State of California, um, I think that one of the biggest problems that we're having with, continually, with infections is unclean surfaces, unclean devices. And uh, I started a uh, subcommittee that has uncovered so many things and opened our eyes to what, what we're seeing as really as a problem. And it really boils down to um, each hospital is going to function with their own culture. If the culture says, we are going to prevent these infections, that's our goal. 
that's what we're going to do. You you will see that in the outcome data of those hospitals. You will see that if anyone is harmed by an infection, there is a protocol for understanding why, to getting to the bottom of it, for talking with the patient's families. And if you're in a hospital that's not focused on it, that doesn't have environmental cleaning and monitoring, that isn't making the CDC guidelines the mandatory process, then you'll see it in their outcome data. So it really does boil down to the bottom line is the culture of the hospital and the leadership that supports the team. Thank you, Carol. I think that was a great answer. No, I don't think we have any other questions in the chat as far as right now. I don't know if we have any on the lines or if we have any other thoughts. So if anybody has anything on there that, you know, they've had successes or they may have heard from this conversation that you would like to speak up about, please feel free to. Once again, if you'd like to ask a question, please press star and number one on your telephone keypad. We do not have any questions on the phone at this time. I guess I'd like to ask um, others in the audience if anyone else has had uh, has successfully implemented any interventions that combat antibiotic-resistant infections that others may benefit about uh, from hearing about. Anyone facing challenges with implementing interventions uh, related to antibiotic resistance? And we didn't have any questions over this phone at this time. So, Andrew, it looks like you've had some experience. Would you like to elaborate for us? And if you if you'd like to speak, um, you can press star one on your telephone keypad. Once again, please press star one if you'd like to add a question or comment. And we do not have any questions or comments over the phone at this time. We now have hi, a question. Is, oh, hi, this is Carol Moss. I, I could make a statement there um, based on some of the, the research that we're finding. There is a, I don't think it's in the region of this care, but we found an incredible uh, resource. Her name is Melinda Cooper, and uh, she works with Wake Med um, uh, medical facilities and, and hospitals in South Carolina. And she, she and her team have implemented an incredible environmental cleaning and monitoring program that has made huge strides to reduce and eliminate C. diff infections. And um, if anybody's left on the phone here, I think she would be an outstanding resource for, um, you know, as a speaker. She works uh, now in environmental cleaning. She's gotten several promotions, but she actually traveled to Dubai, all around different countries, and shares their success of how they've been able to um, reduce C. diff infection. So just a, a, an important statement there. Um, she's not the only one, but she's one of the best ones that, that I've talked to as far as knowing all the nuts and bolts and getting the results. And Andrew Armenta has uh, queued up four questions. The line is open. Can you hear me? We can. Can you hear me? Hello? We can. Okay. First of all, I did some studies at my facility uh, with the uh, ATP, adenosine triphosphate uh, meter, that measures basically anything living. It's living, there's ATP in it. Um, with the surface cleaners that the facilities use on surfaces and on the medical equipment, uh, they usually do a good job of bringing these numbers to compliance. The ATP meters, uh, they just measure whatever is on the surface. 
and they give us a threshold of like zero to ten, it's considered clean. Anything from ten to maybe, uh, uh, I believe they changed it to a hundred, uh, light lumens, uh, is considered caution, and anything above one hundred is considered a fail. So, when I came across, uh, bacteria or services that were already cleaned, when I came across these services, uh, that were, uh, of course, uh, non-compliant, above 100, um, using the cleaners was no problem. However, coming back the next day, I was able to find, and with the room empty, coming back the next day, I was able to still pick up these numbers. Um, and when I changed the cleaner to bleach and came back 24 hours later, the numbers were compliant. Which I learned that uh, these uh, bacteria were, were resistant to some of the cleaners. Was it CDF? I don't know. I just know that it was resisting some of these cleaners. Can I assume it was CDF? No, I can't do that. But, you know, the, uh, the room was actually, uh, uh, had been cleaned for the last two weeks. The patient died with tuberculosis, and I found a smudge on the, uh, the bedroom a uh, tray where the patient eats. Uh, I actually found it through a UV uh, A light or a black light, and then I tested it. And um, the numbers were, uh, first of all, the numbers were exceptionally high, but the next day when they came back, uh, they were uh, still failing. They weren't as high, but they were still in the fail. When I used bleach, the numbers were very compliant, uh, you know, within, I think it was within five light movements. Um, but you know, it, I, I, I try to understand why I don't think uh, hospital cleaning crews have a better surveillance like this. Um, I found numerous uh, with the defibrillators and to do their checks. Uh, whatever they use, whatever they use to touch, they have to do it every shift change. I was finding uh, regularly dirty uh, dials uh, to the to, to, uh, charge buttons. Um, they weren't cleaning them, and I don't know what to do, that they have to do these checks. That's why I honed in on the uh, on-off button and the dial. But, you know, we're able to find trends in, 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 in dirty surfaces. Very easy. Um, and in the heart room, I mean, just checking the, the, the heart lung machine, checking the for clients, check the clients, finding it dirty, you know, letting me, the uh, director know that I found the hard lung machine dirty, so she could get on our so contact with the personnel to clean the hard lung because EVS can't clean that stuff. Now, you know, there's, there's numerous other areas that I was able to diagnose and list the hazard in an environment of care committee meeting, and I was able to see closure, and as a result, the hospital level of awareness of what they're supposed to clean came up. Because they you know, really they do with this post clean, but they don't know what's dirty. And when you tell them what's dirty, they're able to get better at cleaning and ha have less uh, less problematic uh, areas. Nobody wants to be told to reach that area, in this that spot. But when we were able to go have ongoing checks, they were able to, uh, uh, you know, to, to clean better. That's uh, it took a. It took about two or three years for them to start getting on board. Anyway, that's all I have to say. Well, thank you very much, Andrew. We appreciate your comments. So, now that we've heard from our speakers, I have an ask for all of you. These may look familiar if you participated in the August 2nd National Land Call. First, become empowered. I know many of you are healthcare professionals and quality improvement professionals. But if it came down to it, would you really know how to become involved in your own health care? What about your family's health care? Dr. Newland encouraged you to support antimicrobial stewardship actions and programs, to vaccinate, wash your hands, and support farmers who raise animals without the use of antibiotics. Carol mentioned some excellent resources, and we have those posted on the QIO program website. Kathy can post that link again in the chat. Dr. Alaranta shared about their Jumpstart Stewardship Workbook, specific tools 
found within and how you can use this to improve the delivery of care. I encourage you to review the resources and share them with family, friends, colleagues, and partners. You can start applying today's strategies and best practices immediately. Next, do you have a story to share? Have you or a loved one experienced successful delivery of safe care? If your organization is implementing practices for providing the safest care possible to your patients, on the other hand, what are some of your challenges? Share these with the Clean NCC by emailing Nikki Rosella. Kathy will include her email in the chat. These stories can help guide the content for our future learning activities. As we mentioned earlier, we would love to hear topic ideas from you all for future offerings through this venue. If you have any needs or any ideas, please send them through chat. Email us at quinncc at area d .org or provide these ideas in your post-event assessment. We'd also like to invite you to join us for the next formal National Learning and Action Network event on Tuesday, November 1st, 2016. The topic will be focused on promoting effective prevention and treatment of chronic disease. Please take a moment to complete our post-event assessment. Your individual feedback helps drive our future calls. We review and consider each and every response and all of your feedback. You can contact Nikki Rosellis with any questions. Thank you. Any last questions, feel free to submit through chat. Upon closing the WebEx session, you will be invited to share your thoughts and feedback through a post-event assessment. We greatly value this feedback and would appreciate you taking just a few minutes for completion. I'd like to thank all of our speakers for today, Carol Moss, Dr. Newland, and Dr. Sharon Alaranza. And of course, thank you to all of our participants for being here with us today. Have a great afternoon. That concludes the conference call. You may now dismiss. Thank you, Carol. Hi, Sharon. Hi, Jolene, here.